Um, hey there, it's Penny with Braven and Broken, and I'm here with Margaret Holzer again. This is our session number two, mini Ooh. session. Yeah. Uh, Margaret, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, Margaret Holzer, a uh, two-time Olympian, national spokesperson for the National Children's Advocacy Center, and uh, all-around advocate. Perfect. Um, today, we want to talk about signs of child sexual abuse, and we, we were talking earlier and wanted to come on and, and give some examples so that you all will know what to look for and if you see it to be thinking about. Yes, um, we often talk about how it's important to recognize the signs and report, um, but sometimes it's kind of hard to know what the signs are um, that you're supposed to recognize. So we thought that we would be helpful and try to help you know what those signs are so that you, you can recognize them. Perfect. And one of the ones that we talk about a lot and we hear a lot is like bedwetting, um, thumb sucking or nail biting, something that changes that didn't used to happen. That's a really big one to be thinking about. I think the biggest thing is knowing your kids um, in whatever manner that is and just looking for signs that are different. Um, so the biggest thing is that this is going to manifest itself in kids in a lot of different ways, right? Some kids are going to suck their thumbs naturally or bite their nails naturally. I sometimes bite my nails now and I'm in my 30s. Um, <clears throat> but it's, it's looking for changes in kids doing things that they weren't normally doing. So if you have a kid that's really silent, all of a sudden they're acting out. Or maybe you have a kid that's more, that's outgoing normally, all of a sudden become really silent. Um, so it's going to, you're going to have to know the kid a little bit to begin with. Um, but if you're a parent or a teacher, these are going to be kids that you're interacting with a little bit more frequently and just, just noticing signs and, and things that come, that, that strike you as being a little bit out of the norm. Yes. And I think that one of the keys to that too would be a straight A student whose grades start to fall or, um, a not so straight A student whose grades start to go up. Um, cause we also have that experience. So one extreme to the next, I think is pretty significant. So that's a really good way to put that. What exactly. Else? Exactly. Um, well, to that point, I think we talk a lot of times, um, of, of things that <clears throat> on the negative side, right? It's, it's really easy to see when a kid acts out, um, and is maybe doing something negatively, right? Like if someone's misbehaving or they're doing something that just, Bring, draws negative attention. Um, if they're older, maybe they're they're drinking, getting into drugs and alcohol, that kind of thing. Um, but sometimes it's a little harder to notice when things go the opposite direction. When you have a kid that's maybe been really open and and inviting and really outgoing, start to draw into themselves, start to to become um, just a little bit quieter, and and you know maybe more reclusive, right? And they're just, they're just not that same outgoing bubbly personality that they used to be. Um, sometimes, I mean, I was an overachiever, right? Like I, I had to be perfect in every single area of my life. So, you know, it, again, it, it just, it manifests itself differently, but I think sometimes those kids that are overachievers or sometimes draw in on themselves are missed versus the kids that are acting out in a negative way, because it, when you act out negatively, that that does draw attention to yourself versus the kid who's just kind of shy and quiet in the corner. Yeah, I agree. And I think that that's significant because you and I both were in the same boat where we wanted to be better. And like you said, be as best as we could possibly be where others are acting out and um, causing problems. Yeah. Yeah. What else did you do, Margaret, in your situation? What did you experience? So one thing that I found out when, and I didn't find this out until after the fact, actually, um, was I developed a block, which sometimes kids will develop blocks in, um, you know, different areas of their life. Um, but I kind of developed a, a learning block uh, in school. Um, for me in particular, it was in reading. I had a really, really hard time learning how to read. And um, that actually was really obvious to my parents. Um, one, just because of the difficulty. But two, it stood out because I think my parents realized that I was smart and they realized that I wasn't struggling in other areas of school and they couldn't figure out why I just had this block in this one area mm -hmm. and why everything else seemed to be normal and I just couldn't get this. Um, so they were very, very aware of that. And then also, um, you know, kids are doing standardized testing, IQ testing, that kinds of thing. 
um, in schools. And I had a, an IQ test at some point, I think in first grade. And the, um, the tester actually told my mom um, after the fact that for a child my age, I was extremely untrusting and that that wasn't normal. And, and, you know, at the time my mom thought that was odd, but she just didn't know why or have any reason to attribute it to anything. Um, and then of course, you know, hindsight's always 2020, but afterwards it was like, oh, you know, if, if she had known to put that in, in to think about why. Um, so I think, again, that speaks to if you do have a kid, cause I mean, we are naturally trusting, right? We are not, we are not, is humans taught to be untrusting unless that's a learned response um so so children are naturally just they're they are going to be open they are that doesn't mean they're going to be talkative but they're they're naturally going to be trusting individuals and so we've learned to not trust people and so i think when you see that shift happen and you see a kid go from just trusting and and kind of lose that um and then especially at a young age, if they are really untrusting, it, there's a reason for that. It may not be sexual abuse. It could be physical abuse, you know? I mean, it, it, there, there's a lot of reasons why that could happen, but it's it's definitely worth investigating and going, where where did this come from? Because it, it could be an equally bad problem um, that, you know, you might want to know about. Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, one thing that we talked about a little bit before this is, um, like 90% of abusers know or victims know their abuser. Mm -hmm. And yeah. one of the things that we were sharing, you and I were about gifts. And I was thinking, okay, in yes. my experience with my biological father, I don't remember like being bought off. It was more threatful. But one thing I do remember is him joking with me like I was an adult in front of other people, mm -hmm. my mom and like this, like just a joking and kind of teasing that wouldn't have been with a father and a daughter. Yeah. Um, so I think that's unusual situations and behavior between an adult and a child is another, could be another trigger. But then let's talk about gifts a little bit because you had a really good take on that. And I think that's a good thing to bring up. Yeah. Um, you know, so I think it's, it's fairly common knowledge that um, part of the grooming process is gaining trust and gaining trust is, you know, it starts off small. It starts off with finding thing, you know, interest and, in, um, finding something that the child likes and then buying something small and, and getting bigger and bigger and bigger, right? Um, but I think there's this misconception that that's only going to happen with someone that is outside of the family. And, and the reality is, is I think that can happen just as equally within the family as it can outside of the family. Um, you know, in a, in a healthy family, um, you know, that doesn't have abuse, for example, like you're going to have two parents are going to know what the other parent is buying. And, and I'm not talking about just you're at Target and, you know, you see a, something cute in the checkout line and you buy your kid a, a $3 stuffed animal or $5 or something, right? I mean, that that's not important and you're not going to just, you know, call your spouse and discuss that right. with them. Um, but if you're going to buy your kid a $300 bicycle, that's, you're not just going to go purchase that and your spouse has no idea. Um, so those are going to be the kind of things that, that most couples are going to talk about and they're going to discuss. So you, within your relationship, if you start noticing that your kid is, is getting these things and you don't know about it, that should be a red flag. If you start seeing an accumulation of expensive things, or even if it's just a lot of things, um, those are, are conversations that you need to be having within your relationship and, you know, shouldn't just be happening without your knowledge. Agreed. Agreed. Um, yeah. what about, oh, let's see, what about, I know what I was going to say. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Took me a second. Um, the other thing that I've experienced with other, um, especially adults, parents in conversations that I've had is their kids end up drawing pictures that are out of character for their yeah. age. Um, so one would be, you know, drawing some kind of a sexual um, photo, not our picture, not anatomy, because as kids begin to get older and they draw things, that could be something um, that they're mm -hmm. learning about. But if there's um, some normal thing that they're supposed to draw a house and it turns into something sexual, I think there's something there um, that could be a trigger as well. 
Yeah, and this actually goes um, kind of back to our, our, our signs uh, that we were talking about earlier, which is um, just things becoming more sexualized in general, whether it's drawing pictures, whether it's play acting in, in a sexual way. Um, one of the signs can be just kids becoming hypersexualized. So if you have kids in, in a young, you know, playing doctor and they're, they're sexualizing that, right? Um, even amongst each other with other kids. So it, sometimes, you know, yes, kids are going to be curious and, and they're going to want to learn about body parts and, and there are age appropriate things. Um, but there are things that are not age appropriate as well. And there's things that are, it, it, you ask the question, right? So it's it's not necessarily that everything is bad or that that it's not normal or natural. Um, but when you see those things, you just want to have that conversation and and where what is making the kid want to sexualize play playing doctor? What is making the kid want to draw a sexualized picture in school or in class or at home or wherever it is that they're drawing this? Um, and just starting to have those conversations and where is this coming from? What is it from? And I think just that open dialogue. That's good. In our last video, we talked a little bit about secrets and surprises. And I think that's another one to remember as a sign that they're, you know, a, a child's refusal to talk about a secret um, that really isn't a normal thing, a normal surprise. That That's also another sign. And then clues. Um, for instance, I told a youth group leader that my father loves me differently than he loves other like my brother or my or other other parents would love their kid or dropping hints of something related to um like provoke a discussion about sexual type of conversation um kids do tell and they try to tell um just in different ways depending on what they know or at what they think they can do yeah absolutely absolutely um and and to your to your point about having those adult conversations that aren't age appropriate, um, you know, I mean, I, I was in the same situation where I, I, you know, remember having a discussion about, you know, Playboy magazine um, with my offender. And, you know, that's, you don't discuss Playboy with a six-year-old, you know, and, and you don't discuss the pictures and, and what the people in the pictures, you know, are doing and look like and, and, you know, the female body and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and you, so it's, it is, it's having those adult discussions, um, to your point, sharing that with someone else and bringing that up and, and, you know, these are the conversations I had with your dad or with so-and-so's dad, or, you know what I mean? And, and I think kids do, they, they test the waters they want to see how you're going to react. And so they're going to bring things up in such a way because they want to see, is this person going to believe me? Is this person going to react badly? Is this person going to freak out? You know, um, so they're going to, they're going to start dropping little hints just to kind of see what is the reaction going to be and how is this person going to handle it? Because it's not even, sometimes it's about belief, but sometimes it's just about, can this person handle the information? Are they strong enough to handle this? Are they going to break? Right. If this person, if I don't think this person's strong enough to handle this, then I'm not necessarily going to tell them, you know, either. Yeah, agreed. And that's the situation I was in with my mom. I knew for sure it would break her. Um, yeah. when we get into adolescent kids. I think there's other signs that we need to watch for and be attentive to. Uh, self injury, cutting, um, burning, and then th another one is personal hygiene. Not being, not taking care of themselves. And uh, making sure, especially in significant changes, like all of these things would, that we've been talking about is really goes back to something that was one way and then it had an extreme change to something different. Drug abuse, um, running away from home. Yeah. And um, suicide attempts. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. I think it all comes back to knowing your kids. Um, again, and that, and that doesn't have to mean that they are literally your kids. Um, you can be a youth group leader, you can be a coach, you know, um, you, you can be a teacher is, but you, you know, your kids, right? You, you, you learn the children that are around you and you, you know, their basic behaviors. And when you see something out of the ordinary, 
you know, it's simple as just asking, how was your day? Or, you know, are you feeling okay? Or, you know, sometimes it's just a really basic conversation, um, but it's creating a safe space so that, that that child feels like they can come to you and they can talk to you if they need to. But just being aware of those kind of behavior changes and, and seeing, okay, is this just a one day thing, right? Maybe they're just having a bad day, right? Everybody has bad days. But, but being aware of it, is this a one day change or is this happening more often? Is this something that you're seeing repeatedly? Is this a, a change that's been long term? Well, that's good. And I think something that's really important that we need to remember is you don't have to have proof, right? You don't have to catch an abuser offending a child. If a child is is leading you to believe there might be something wrong, then you need to take action and you need to start having the conversation or you need to get support and help from the local uh, child advocacy centers or other resources available. And we'll put some of those up um, at the end of this video as well. Yeah, you're not going to catch them. I mean, that's the reality. Like the odds of you walking in and, and seeing it in the act are practically non-existent. Um, so that proof, if you will, that I think people think they're going to have or that they're waiting for, it's just not gonna happen. You have to go off of that gut feeling. You have to trust that gut feeling that I think people are afraid of. Um, it makes people uncomfortable because I, you know, I understand. You know, people are afraid of ruining someone's life, and people are afraid of, you know, what if I'm wrong? And and what makes this so difficult is it's, you know, out of context. We can all sit here and say, okay, we want to do the right thing. And of course, if it was me, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to call someone, I'm going to turn this person in. But we're saying that right now, not knowing an offender and talking about a nameless person that's just, you know, labeled offender. And we don't know who this person is. But then all of a sudden, when you say, this is my husband or my significant other or my uncle or my grandfather or my cousin or, you know, the, the guy that lives next door to me that I've known for 15 years or my friend that I've known for 20 years, right? It's totally different than when you put a name to this person and you have a relationship with that person. Because not only does this offender have a relationship with the child, they nine times out of 10 have a relationship with the family because that grooming process isn't just about the kid. If this, I mean, that's the whole thing. Unless the offender is, I mean, when it's within the family, you know, it's, it's obviously easy for the offender to have access to the child because it's their child. But when it's not in the family, the, the offender has to have access to the child. So they have to groom the family in order to have access to that child. They have to put themselves in a position where they're going to have access. Um, so the majority of the time, the family has also been groomed. And it is going to be someone that the family knows and trusts because I, I say this all the time, um, and I hope this reference never, you know, dies and, and, and people don't know what I'm talking about, but it's never going to be the, the creepy guy from Silence of the Lambs, right? Like, it's never going to be the guy in the white van that just, like, is horrific looking and we're all like, oh my God, you know, if it was that easy, <laughs> like, police officers wouldn't have a job. Um, I wish it was that easy, but it's not. And so I think that's what makes this so difficult is that when you put a name to it and you put, hey, this is a person I know and trust, then all of a sudden people start second guessing themselves and going, I've known so-and-so for 15 years. I don't want to ruin their life if I'm wrong. Right. And I think we, we're seeing that a lot right now, right? With the Boy Scouts and yeah. churches yeah. and um, other sporting, you know. Yeah, yeah. Sporting groups. And we're seeing these are trusted people that have worked very, very hard to have their plans laid out and they are calculated, they're manipulative and, and really violent in a very um, strategic and psychological way. Oh, they're good at what they do, unfortunately. I mean, they're absolutely, I mean, I, I, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but um, I want to say like the average offender offends like 75 kids or 100 kids. Or, it's, it's like some horrifically staggering number. It's not two. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a really high number. That's just absolutely petrifying. Um, and, and in order to do that, you, you have to, to be smart about how you do this. And, and I'm not saying that to scare people. Um, I'm just saying that mostly because 
you're not alone in, in, in if you've ever been in this position thinking that it's it's hard to turn somebody in or that it's it's hard second guessing yourself of you know am i going to be wrong am i doing the right thing and that's kind of where it's it's learning to trust that gut instinct if it doesn't feel right you have to just believe it and you have to trust yourself and inherently know that it's you know it's probably not right and and i say that based on having maybe not got, gotten the disclosure. I think it's a little easier if you have a full out disclosure, because if, if you've, you know, you've got a kid coming to you and saying, this is what's happened to me. Yeah. Okay. That's, that would be harder in my opinion to turn away from, but I'm talking about when you just suspect it, no one's told you anything, you don't have a disclosure. That's when you just have to absolutely trust yourself and go, you know what? I may not have the evidence, but I'm just going to trust this. And you know, I'm going to do the right thing. And, and, you know, if it's, if it's wrong, it's wrong, but it's probably not. Right. I agree with you. And, and that kind of goes back to that everyone, and I, and I, this is how I teach it. Everyone's a mandated reporter. Absolutely. Everyone's responsibility on this planet to protect kids and to, I agree. What report call, even call 911 and tell you, you need a, you need a welfare check. Yep. And some yep. get in the store for e even for that matter, especially with human trafficking that's going on as well. Yes. We just we need to be diligent and we need to not worry about what people think in this category. We just need to go with it. Absolutely. Well, and to that point on human tra human trafficking, um, if you see a a you know young girl with a much older guy at the mall, you don't have to know who the person is. And that's a fantastic example of, you know, just call nine one one, ask for a human welfare check. Yep. You know, that's a, that's a great way to do it. If you're just literally in, <laughs> out and about and you don't know, you know, your resources, it's a great way to do it. Yeah. I had once I was leaving um, the airport for my job and stopped at 7-Eleven to get gas. And there was a situation that felt very uncomfortable. A young girl was getting in a, in a white van with a older male. And I just called 911 and said, I need a welfare check. And here's the license plate number. I don't know yeah. if anything happened of it. I just think it's our responsibility um, if something is feeling weird that we, we call it out. Um, yeah. So anything else on signs or grooming today that we want to talk about? Um, I think that's pretty much it for now. Thank so, you. yeah. Stay tuned because we'll be back. We've got a whole laundry list of topics. Um, oh, yeah. A great month to really make sure we don't lose sight of Child Abuse Prevention Month and Sexual Assault Awareness. And even though all of the events have been canceled for in-person stuff, um, it is not going to go by the wayside. No. And again, um, even though we have things we want to talk about, please, like I said, feel free to reach out to both of us. Let us know if you want us to talk about something or you have questions. Um, you know, we're not mind readers and, and we would love to talk about whatever it is that people are curious or want to know about. Or if you have, you know, questions for us, we would love to you know, to tell you about our stories or, you know, answer questions as well. That sounds perfect. And we will be, we're working on a live event, so we'll keep you posted and we'd love to do a Q and A through there as well. So yeah, so you watch our pages. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Margaret. Bye. Bye. I almost um, <laughs> tried to end the recording by touching the screen.